the body is at war when our, in, our identities, our sense of self is not integrated. In fact, for me, when I began my journey, I had no sense of self. When people would say sense of self, I'd be like, what? <laughs> Who am I and where do I live? I, I, I was pretty much a shell, right? I felt very empty. And so, yeah, with somatics, I started to come in. It's like we become that interoceptive awareness, that sense of our internal states comes with the practice of being curious about sensations. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mujica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. Welcome Inge Sengelman to my podcast. Thank you for being with me today. So excited to be with you, Luis. It's been um, a long time since we talked and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, it was interesting because you're one of those people that I heard in some other space. I was watching a replay of something you did for the Somatic Experiencing International. Yes. And your presence and your words and your tone and everything you were saying, it was just weaving through my body. And I thought I have uh, to speak to this person. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so I kind yes. of wanted to start with just saying, maybe just introducing yourself to us. Tell us okay. how you want us to know you. Okay. Well, we met in the context of uh, multiculturalism and how to navigate being multicultural in a or in being in a white, white passing body in a world uh, that is uh, uh, so binary. Uh, and it was an interesting conversation where I talked about the fact that I grew up in Nicaragua and many people don't know because I have a German name. They don't know that I was an immigrant to the United States and uh, currently I'm an immigrant in Portugal. So I'm sitting in the Azores as we speak and uh, so my roots are um, Latin American, and I'm fully bilingual in Spanish and other languages. So, uh, And I came to somatic experiencing when I became a therapist because I had done work in the body to heal and knew that I wanted to be a somatic-oriented uh, practitioner, uh, not just a cognitive behavioral therapist, and uh, went to an SE training and fell in love. And since then, I've been assisting, uh, supporting students as they learn SE and doing consultations. And uh, additionally, um, I'm a yogi, I'm a yoga practitioner and teacher and uh, meditator. And what else can I say? All of those things kind of blend together for me. It's just beautiful. I'm just enjoying kind yeah. of going on that with you. I was thinking I, I had such a similar experience where I went into, I was about to go back and finish my psychology major. And then I went to one weekend of a somatic experiencing immersion. And I said, this is for me. I just yeah. fell in love, right? Yeah coming into the body, right? The place that is home. To me, this is home. Many mm. people ask me, well, where are you from? Or, you know, where do you live? And I live right here. <laughs> this oh, is... I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love and, that. and when you arrive here, then you can be anywhere. You know, it's easier to adapt and to uh, belong. You know, I think I think that was part of the conversation that you heard that intrigued you was about where do we belong when we have these multiple identities, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, you know, do you belong in one group, in another group, or do you belong in all of them, you know? And so belonging mm. to me had to be a, an internal feeling. See, let's, uh, let's be with that. That's, yeah. that's the gold right there. Mm -hmm. I just want everyone to hear that again, how belonging in yourself right belonging yes. to this part of you where wherever you are it's in the body is where you belong yes it's your essence the essence that is inhabiting your body you know mm -hmm. i find that so important for me 
Um, and yes, that was the piece that really lit me up when I was listening to the replay. Uh, because I think the I think the gift of being multicultural is you don't fit anywhere. That's mm. that's the gift. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And so I kind of want to hear a little bit about your experiences of not belonging before you learned how to just belong to yourself. Tell us about that. Yes. Oh, it's so fascinating because when I was in uh, graduate school for social work, one of my mentors and someone I really uh, admire and adore, he just, he was a great professor and he was Moroccan who went to Canada, who then went to the United States. And one day I, I told him, you know, I don't feel like I belong anywhere. And he was like, oh, that's so sad. And I meant it like you meant it. Like, because I don't have a citizenship, so to speak, I feel like I can belong anywhere, you know, and not in that trauma-based adaptation in which you mold yourself like a chameleon, mm -hmm. but rather because you learn to appreciate multiplicity of ethnicities and cultures and languages. You know, I've always been fascinated by all of that. And, uh, but I have to say that there, there was a lot of trauma involved when I, uh, I left my country was because of a war and, and uh, came to the United States as a refugee. And I was uh, living with uh, some relatives in New Orleans and, going to this uh, Catholic girls' school where everybody, I mean, to me, I it was like I landed on an alien planet because mm -hmm. there were all these young women who were not at all aware of the world around them. And, uh, you know, they were concerned with teenage things and girl things. And I was like coming from this real serious stuff. And so I was, I really literally walked around my high school years in a dissociated state, you know, and it wasn't until I went to my 30th year reunion that I was talking to some of my friends and they were re relating memories. And I was like, where was I? You know, I don't remember any of that, you know, and I do remember some things, but uh, yeah, it was surreal, surreal. And I learned to speak English, you know, without much of an accent. And um, I, I went through that whole adaptation that it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I realized was whitewashing of my identity. You know, it was um, even, you know, even the language, you know, I felt so proud that I integrated, right? And that's great. It, it's important. However, it was like whole parts of my identity were washed away, you know, because you I want wanted, to hear you. S yeah. I'm sorry, because you wanted. I wanted to fit in. I think that that's the right. I'm so glad you said the last piece. I wanted to fit in because I hear I actually like the term integrating. It's assimilating and kind of like mimicking. Mm -hmm. I, I find to be the I want to fit in. Whereas the integration is all my parts are in relationship with this, with this place, with this experience, you know, whatever it is we're going through. And I think it's, um, it's an art to find that way to integrate and allow those pieces of you to relate together, to kind of be online and sharing this experience yes. as a whole, not as just parts did, did you have an actual practice for that? Did somatics help you with that? Tell us like how you developed that. Oh, somatics was critical to it. Um, and, you know, I'll describe it for the listeners, even as you were saying those things, you were weaving with your hands, you were and bringing your hands towards your center. And that's kind of how it feels. It's like mm -hmm. a weaving. And, you know, um, I'll say this, for a long time, all those parts were at war. And I listened to some of your other podcasts around how disease starts. And yes, I had an autoimmune disorder. I had, eventually I had cancer. And, you know, so my, you know, the body is at war when our, in, 
our identities, our sense of self is not integrated. In fact, for me, when I began my journey, I had no sense of self. When people would say sense of self, I'd be like, what? <laughs> Who am I and where do I live? I, I, I was pretty much a shell, right? I felt very empty. And so, yeah, with somatics, I started to come in. It's like we become that interoceptive awareness, that sense of our internal states comes with the practice of being curious about sensations, being curious about um, uh, even emotions were elusive to me at the time that I began my journey, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, it was both a, a, a therapeutic journey, also a spiritual journey. So I was into beginning to learn meditation, learning mindfulness, learning yoga, and at the same time, uh, starting to do some work. And it was a friend of mine who led me first to a network chiropractor, you know, which was light touch chiropractic. It was like the beginning acupuncture, you know, body work. All those things were part of the weaving of the journey. And then eventually I started to find therapists that were trained in some kind of body orienting or oriented modality. But the one I've fallen in love with is somatic experiencing because it's so nuanced. And one of the things that I love is the fact that uh, we talk about resources and counter vortex, not just trauma vortex, you know, not just being in the core of the trauma, but building this whole world of resources that can support our healing. And um, yeah, I lost my train of thought right there. Maybe you have something to add. I would say good timing because, <laughs> because I have a bunch of things coming up. Um, I just want to go back to this, where do I belong? Where do I live? Because you're, you're coming to that from this multicultural perspective, um, I, you know, actually living in different lands and different cultures and experience that in real time. I came from that from being born into a multi multicultural home and family. So I born in America, this is my culture I've experienced. Yet my identity and my family and different skin tones and everything was ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And I came out looking like this. And so, <laughs> you know, and so it was always interesting because I didn't identify with any um, box that I could check um, anywhere really, whether it be a race or even sexuality, it just, mm -hmm. I have always felt so fluid in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So uh, I come to it from that place. You come to it from your place. The it that we're both coming to is realizing when I orient externally to belong, I suffer. Yes. When, right. When I orient internally to belong, I don't suffer. I just want us to riff on that more. So people listening who I mean, I think at this point, most people are multicultural, but yes. if, if they don't identify as such, we don't even have to pigeonhole ourselves into the multicultural perspective, just the belonging place that yeah. we came to from being multicultural. Tell us more about like the somatic experience of orienting outward to belong compared to inward. Yes, it's well, and, and even in Nicaragua, I grew up in a multicultural family because my father is 100% German, born and raised in Nicaragua, but of German parents. So my grandparents were German. And so uh, there was always a confusion. And so somatically, when you start to explore it, there can be, I call it visceral confusion, it's like things are out of rhythm and they can't find their rhythm, and rhythm like even the organs. And it's like, uh, 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 you know, and then, you know, you start to explore maybe some, some generational traumas and even more like, how do I, you know, there were Nazis and anti-Nazis in my family. There were Jews in my German family. There was so oppressor and oppressed within us, right? Um, and, and then the, the indigenous, uh, versus the colonizer, 
you know, and so when I started to, when I had come enough into my body to start to experience these things, it's, it was like, like gut, literally gut wrenching. And (laughs) I don't know how to describe it, but it's literally like your organs are twerking in there, Mm -hmm. you know? And if you stay with it, if you're able to be the witness and you have enough support and enough presence, uh, things begin to organize and get into rhythm. And I think that's the key to healing is, you know, if you talk about coherence, that's what it is, right? Coherence is when, when not just breath and heart are working in synchrony, but all of our systems. And then if you're like, I know you are someone who explores multidimensionally, then, you know, all of these dimensions begin to kind of be in rhythm and dance and flow. Hmm. And, and that to me is the ultimate bliss. And, you know, what else is the sense of belonging, but not that, right. This kind of blissfully being in yourself. Hmm. I'm loving this term visceral confusion. I think it's so spot on. And I think those of you listening, you could probably feel it even as we say it, if you're experiencing it now or if your body remembers it, it, it the viscera, those organs, the, the fascia, the tissues, literally, they just constrict and they curl up and all this disorganization happens, you know, biologically inside of us. I, I guess what I'm curious about, so I'll say, speaking for myself, loss of identity actually released my visceral confusion because my my grasping for identity was too limiting for me because of my ambiguity and because like you say the multidimensionality of the consciousness and such <laughs> where do you go with that well i'm i'm loving what you said it's it it's for me it's not necessarily loss of identity however it's in the letting go something new released, right? Something new organized, something maybe more real, right? More true. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm loving that language around letting go of grasping, grasping for identity and I'm making the gesture of grasping, right? Because sometimes there's nothing to grasp and And then ambiguity. I love that word ambiguity because I think ambiguity makes humans seemingly uncomfortable, right? And and that's creating a lot of the dynamics of uh, polarization and uh, division because we are so uncomfortable with ambiguity. And what I hear that you did is you became very comfortable with ambiguity, right? And everything's settled. (laughs) I love this so much. I so I just had uh, tea the other day with a new friend. Um, she's this amazing writer and and um, I guess we call her like a poet philosopher, um, Sophie Strand. And I'm gonna have her on the podcast in a, I don't know sometime this year. But she had said this incredible term: um, low ambiguity threshold. Oh, I love it. <laughs> So when you just said being comfortable in, in ambiguity, I thought, yes, because the for me, the grasping for identity, and what I mean by that is I mean someone else's idea of someone, really, you know, an identity someone else formed. And that was especially the normalized identities, like every culture has the one that we think is the standard. Then there's right. all these kind of fringe identities on the side or the ambigu- ambiguous ones yeah. that kind of lack identity. Mm-hmm. The grasping for that for me came from a low ambiguity threshold. I didn't have the capacity to be with all these contradictory multitudes within myself, right? Yes. But then as that capacity built, it was like, I'm actually at home in myself for the first time. Yes, exactly. And then you don't need to grasp, but you can explore all those multiplicities and the richness of it that's important when you said grasp and explore i just wanted to kind of feel those two yeah that's a big difference it's a big difference because now that you have more capacity all of that energy can live within you right Mm. 
Mm. I also hear with gra- if I'm grasping identity, it's a fixed state of who I am. If I'm exploring identity, it's a fluid state of who I am. It's changing moment by moment. Yes, yes. And part of the, I think, the gift of uh, working in the SE model, right, with resources and counter vortex, is that I I started to explore all of those parts of me that had been erased. And again, this goes for anybody with different identities, with, you know, sexual orientation, gender, you know, you name it, all all of it, you can, you know, now begin to see, oh, what about my indigenous roots? Oh, what is, what do I want to know about that? What are the gifts that maybe I had lost because that was erased. What about the gifts from even the Germanic ancestors? I started to look into ancient tribes. What were they like? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that my name comes from one of the original tribes, original Germanic tribes. No idea. But we can become curious about um, those parts of us that maybe were lost or we didn't have the capacity to hold all of it because everything has energy. And so when it's a lot of energy and our physiology doesn't yet have the capacity, we fragment and we dissociate, right? But once you've expanded that container, then, oh, you can hold more. I'm really moved as well by the idea of, um, because I come up, I hear this a lot in um, especially people who are white presenting and multicultural uh, where they won't they won't look at certain roots because of let's say the harm that a certain lineage caused yeah yet uh and amber mczeal one of my favorite people and and amazing things that she has shared with us in this podcast and in my work um she asked the question you know all of your ancestors at one point were indigenous, right? Like everyone's ancestors at some point were indigenous, some closer, some further back. Right. And so to overcouple um, white with colonizer is just very short-sighted. It's yeah. currently the experience we've experienced, right? The colonization of the Americas came from Europe. And before that, who were they? Like the, the curiosity of, well, yeah. there's so much love in me. I don't have to reduce it to good, bad based on lineage. There's a nuance even within that. How do it's, you navigate that? Exactly. Um, you know, I, I've, I've done many experiences, uh, some with somatic experiencing with Peter Levine and Efuni Yaki, if you've ever mm-hmm. met her. Yeah, she was on here early on. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And uh, she does more a constellations work type work. But I, I'd also done some work with Daniel Four. Do you know him? He was also on yeah. here before. <laughs> oh, an- ancestral <laughs> yeah. medicine. Yeah. And that work asks us to invite healed ancestors. And we all have healed ancestors. And they do part of the repair work. We're not doing all of the repair work in ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, because the reality is that, yeah, going back hundreds of generations, everybody was, everybody's been colonized and everybody's been a colonizer at some point. I mean, th- it seems to be part of the human history, right? That mm-hmm. somebody's trying to oppress somebody else at some point. And so when I mentioned that I did that work around the the Nazi ancestors, uh, it was about uh, making kind of uh, making peace with the parts of me that are colonized sirs and the parts of me that were colonized or uh, in trauma language or SC language talking about uh, the aggressor and the, and the victim or uh, Uh, victim perpetrator dynamics, you know, because I need to make peace peace with the fact that I am just as capable of anybody else of doing Mm. harm Mm. as much as I am of harming. And so how am I going to work with those energies, you know, and and notice I'm putting my hands against each other. It's like um, disintegration. 
that's that profound to me. Um, I'm, I can't help but cut you off because you're making me excited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were saying that integration that has to happen. Yeah. No, and, and cut me off because I love the way the fluidity between our interaction. Yeah, it's fun. You're, you're making me collect <laughs> my thoughts in a different way by our interaction. I, I, that's what I love about relationship is how you, by saying and being and, and, and expressing in front of me, is awakening these things inside of me in real time. I mean, it's it's such gorgeous medicine. And um, I mean, there's so much there you said that I'm just like, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, pull them apart, Louise, take your time. And uh, these two that really resonated with me is I'm capable of harm. And I'm capable of, of healing, right? All of us are. And when I think of working with a lineage, again, many people who do ancestral work will come up to all this kind of um, guilt or shame or pain when they realize, oh, I'm part of this lineage that did this to this people, let's say. Mm -hmm. I personally, when I come up, when I've found that in my body, um, it's interesting to see it through the lens of trauma and somatics because let's say that, like Nazis, like in your lineage, that's a huge collective trauma response, yeah. right? And when we can see it through that lens, we can understand, you know, an individual body had a trauma response to hurt other bodies, created a story about it. It became collective amongst those bodies and it became a huge violent movement. Yeah. And, and it doesn't, it, in any way, it never condones what, you know, it never uh, praises what someone did because they were traumatized. Yeah. However, it gives us this agency of, oh, well, I'm not that right now. So, yes. right, I can go in and connect to those parts and release them from me and be aware that they're in me. So yeah. I don't go into that mindset of I'm better or worse than somebody else. I can just be this kind of balanced plane of I can go either way. So in this self-relating, I stay balanced. Yes, yes. And it, it's so important what you just said about not going into the, the better or worse or bad or, you know, because that's the world of duality, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just like in somatic experiencing, Peter Levine says that the healing is in the movement between the trauma vortex and the counter vortex is the ability to pendulate, right? Uh, the same is said in yoga, right? It, it says that uh, we are liberated when we're able to hold the contradictory, mm. you know, opposing um, uh, whatever the duality is. And mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm able to be with the intense pain again, because I've expanded capacity. When it comes up, I'm able to be with the intense grief, the intense guilt or shame and move through it and i'm also able to be with the extreme joy and elation and euphoria and if i can observe both i i and but i'm the witness right there's yes. the ability to not get caught up in either right not get caught up in better, worse, bad, good, evil, holy. I, I even find, that's what I love about the witness. And I, I often use that term myself or that, that archetype of this, this consciousness, this conscious mind is the witnesser. And it's so far out. It's so psychedelic to me. You know, as I always <laughs> say, I don't need drugs. I have somatics. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because when you get really still and you get in that and you notice whoa i'm witnessing this body i'm not this body it's incredible mm -hmm. and the witnesser in my experience doesn't have identity the witnesser like witnesses different expressions yes. and experiences it can even witness the concepts and stories of identity but it in itself is infinite and yeah. it comes from somewhere else and it's not identified and right I think when I was saying loss of identity earlier, I think that's what I was trying to say. You right? entered entering into non-dual awareness. Right, exactly. Right. Exactly. 
So I respect reality. I respect identity. I respect story and thought. I respect mm -hmm. it because it's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, when I'm living from the witnesser and I'm living from that non-dual conscious mind, I'm not like Latino or white or Irish or German. Like mm -hmm. I'm not that. My body is. It comes yes. from those places. But I'm not those things. I, I just think that's so, f I don't know even how to say anything beyond that about it. It's so far out to me. Can you give yeah. me some language? Well, well, I don't know that I can give you some language, but it's because experience doesn't have language, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. However, I will say this kind of brings me to the, the my yoga lineage is tantric. And so in tantra is about both duality and non-duality. And so in Tantra, all of it is wonderful, the wonderful play of creation to witness, you know? And, and so the, the question is, how are gonna be, we going to mold that reality? How are we going to use story and identity and somatics and to be able to, well, let's go back to the word integrate and feel whole, right? So that we don't use those techniques or methodologies to create more separation or more sense of like, I'm really done with creating a trauma identity. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's so important that we don't reinforce the trauma identity when we're working to heal trauma. Mm -hmm. to tell us what that means for you, for those listening. Uh, trauma Give us an identity. Example. Well, it's when we become identified with our history, the things that happen to us, our symptoms that come from that, and it becomes who we are. And then it makes wanting to change or, or the ability to change uh, almost uh, blocked. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it, it's another reason why I really don't support diagnostic criteria because people become oh i am bipolar and all of a sudden i am that right? yes yes me too love that yeah. and so how do we work towards healing in a way that uh, doesn't reinforce that and it also doesn't reinforce avoidance and pretending that doesn't exist right i wasn't traumatized i that didn't happen i don't have these symptoms yes we need to work with them but it's not who you are because ultimately i think what you described is who we are, right? It's, it's that uh, pure awareness, pure consciousness that resides as our individualized, you know, unique physiologies and mm. psyches that were, you know, designed mm -hmm. to come here for a purpose, right? I love that so much. I I love I all I'll I like to play with those different statements of who am I compared to where am I? Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about past traumatic events that become identities, you know, I, I had personal experience with that and it was so burdensome and heavy because I was invoking this past experience every time I identified as that experience. Yeah. And when it went from who am I, which that was the who, to where am I? It was this question of current reality. Oh, I'm right here in front of you in this chair. I'm not that traumatic experience that happened. Mm -hmm. And it was this kind of like real-time nowness that released a lot of those pressures. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, there's a description of what is trauma is the inability to be present in the here and now, right? Mm -hmm. We keep mm -hmm. getting hijacked to another reality that no longer exists. So... Yes, that's why, you know, anchoring the ability to stay present in the here and now is so important to healing work. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you work, because we're going to start wrapping up. Like, what kind of work do you do? How can people work with you? Tell us a bit about your, your practice. Um, well, first of all, I'm semi-retired and trying to have <laughs> more time for play and um uh, okay, so let me let me throw that out. <laughs> Tell us what you're interested in playing with these days. Well, I I I do love teaching people about trauma, and I do love teaching, uh, working with people to heal their trauma who are uh, maybe have done some work and have gotten somewhere, but are 
uh, now willing to explore in this manner, right? Which is here and now presence oriented to uh, creating the counter vortex. You know, someone asked me to do a, a presentation on the joy of healing trauma. And I had, I had to think about it. I was like, can't there be joy in healing trauma? Mm, yeah. And I thought, oh my God, yes. Yes. Right? Because that's, you know, beginning to connect with resources, beginning to, uh, to connect with orienta- orienting to pleasure through the five senses, healthy mm. pleasures, non-addictive pleasures through, through the five senses. That's the counter vortex that's going to support any healing work. And what is the healing work? It's basically your body releasing the conditioning from those events. It's not about the event itself, as you know. It's not what happened to us or who did it. It's like, how is this encoded in my nervous system, in my DNA, and how can I shift it so I can be fully here, live in this body, and enjoy, be able to enjoy, right? I mean, that's what I want to close on because that's such a potent, yeah. you know, message right there. Um, do Is there a website anyone can find your work or anything about you on? Yeah, embodyyourlife.org. Embody your life because that's what it's about for me, embodying the life force, the essence, that consciousness. Well, Inge, you embody that, and oh, that's what drew me to you. And I'm so grateful you took this time to be with me and speak to us about this. Thank you, Louis. So lovely to be with you. It's really been a pleasure. Ooh. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com. 